Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks Pharmacy. I'm here with the one, the only, and thank God for that, Rudy Daji. How are you, Rudy? I am doing wonderfully today. Apparently a little slow because yeah, those I'll words be... were meaningful and precise. <laughs> I, I try to really put a lot of thought into things before I say them. <laughs> when did that start? About three minutes ago. <laughs> How are you doing now? I've been good. I've been sort of uh, playing around with some new ideas, some new work. So I'm excited about that. And uh, I discovered some new things. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. We're going to talk a little bit, hopefully today, about um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in the long-term long -term care pharmacy space. And hopefully get a little bit into what qualifies you to talk about that. You, Rudy, on the other hand, um, are launching your own consulting business where you're advising companies um, on, on sort of opportunities and the likes. So this is right up your alley. Um, before we get started, Rudy, do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had a lot of success in the pharmacy space and got a little bit of a side hustle in the real estate space I'm doing really well with. And now I've decided to flip it around and help folks uh, with their businesses or um, take board seats, strategic advising, um, you know, interim CEO, CEO positions, and um, just life shit too. So um, that's what I'm doing right now. So if you if you're looking to uh, get some uh, help with optimizing your business or driving revenue or um, adding efficiencies or you know really driving EBITDA, um, we are Rudy.com. You can check it out there. Um, so, but um, yeah, long-term care was a, a, a place that I did really well uh, in the long-term care pharmacy space, to be specific. Um, so let's talk about it. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit to establish some credibility. Um, when did you exit out of the long-term care pharmacy space? So I exited in 2018. I stayed on until mid-2019 as the CEO of my company after exiting. And um, then I parachuted away for a while. And what was the incentive for you to say this, I'm good with what I've achieved so far. It's time for me to leave, time, time to look for new ventures. Yeah, the business had grown tremendously, or I had grown the business, or my team had grown the business over the past six years. I bought it in 2012 with a real mission and ran really hard with strong goals and focused on revenue, but as well focusing on trying to maximize EBITDA. And I'd made a fair amount of money along the way. And then I also sort of at a point where I was like, this has been fun. I enjoy doing it, but you know, like what's next? You know, like I'm not, I don't think I'm the kind of person that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not Jack Welch where I want to run General Electric for, for 20 years. And I also think, um, I don't think people should, you know, I, I think that people have a sort of a limited amount of time that you're effective. I don't think you're always going to, and, and maybe that's arguable, right? You know, you get Warren Buffett that's been doing it and been very successful all, all these years, but you never know. Maybe the person that would have taken his spot would have been even more successful. You know, I, I don't know. Right. So I think that um, people should sort of have a, a, a finite amount of time, but that's just my opinion. For me, I was it had run its course. I built it. It was doing very, very well. And I really think it was sort of at its peak. And since it was at its peak, um, it's the best time to really take chips on the off the table. And there was also a fair amount of interest in the behavioral health long term care space. It was kind of the newest rage. So why not take advantage of that and exit at a high point? <clears throat> So it's important. You spoke a little bit about um, how you exited out. Does that mean that the opportunities in long-term care pharmacy at this point are sort of gone, that we, we you missed the boat if you're trying to get into it now? No, I don't think so. I think that there's still great opportunities. One of um, the folks that was my right-hand person opened his own long-term care pharmacy six months ago and is doing extremely well. He's growing a ton of business. He's you know, month over month, new new business coming in the door and the contracts are there and they're still strong. Um, 
because of the way CMS read med, read, uh, wrote MedD provisions and the way that they subbed it out, they have to have sort of critical mass, otherwise they can't provide a MedD plan, right? So then GPOs like MHA, Innovatix have leverage in negotiations with PBMs versus retail pharmacies have zero leverage, right? So the reimbursements are, and the DIR fees, they're really destroying retail pharmacies and it's just a tough, tough business. In long-term care, you've got some protection. So that's really interesting. What I keep seeing is this idea that there is opportunity. So let's start from the beginning. We said we're going to do a SWOT analysis in this conversation. So what are the strengths of being in the long-term care pharmacy space? I think strengths are higher reimbursements. I think that's the first strength. Anything else or was that it? Oh, I mean, I think that's one. I think that you have a very captive audience like your patient there's a varied amount of different patients and it's growing right as as baby boomers are aging it's growing and that patient base is living longer right so you're going to have them longer and then you've got folks that are in skilled nursing you've got folks that are in in long-term care that that is also broadening what that entails right now you have people residing at home that CMS is saying is considered long-term care, right? So you can still get a higher reimbursement um, contractually on, on those um, folks as well. So, and now there's more marketplaces that you can service, right? You could, you could focus on people residing in their home and do compliance packaging. You could focus on skilled nursing. You could focus on assisted living. You could focus on uh, specialty. You could focus on, um, on uh, behavioral health. You can focus on drug recovery uh, and in all of the, any place where there is considered long term care, you can and, and you have to be a closed door pharmacy. Right. So there, it, it's 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 up to you if that's a benefit or not. To me, I think that's a benefit because you're not dealing with the public. You're very focused and very precise and very specialized. And, and I think in all business today, being surgically precise is the way to go right like one of my neighbors is a <clears throat> is very successful uh groundwork company and all he does is groundwork right he's not gonna pour a foundation he's not gonna pave he's not gonna do all these other things but he's very very specific in what he does and i think business today um being everything to everyone is just not the best or most efficient um play so, so we're hearing a little bit about these risks, uh, these, these opportunities, sorry, these strengths. We're talking higher reimbursement, captive audience. There are more patients. Um, you, you're focused. You're, you can focus, for example, in skilled nursing facilities. Uh, patients re residing at home would be considered to be long-term care, assisted living facilities, specialty, behavioral health, drug recovery, all of which would fall under this long-term care facility um, umbrella. How do you define long-term care facility? How does CMS define it? Um, I don't really know the actual verbiage on how CMS defines it, to be honest with you. So that's something that uh, maybe, do you know? Because I know you're- No, no I don't know off the top of my head. I, I just didn't know if it's based on length of stay or if it's based on certain criteria. Have to be it's, met very, it's very loosely defined. So it's sort of mm -hmm. up to some interpretation too. They didn't sort of come out and say, if you're in a skilled nursing facility, we consider that long-term care. And keep in mind too, Generally speaking, reimbursement rates are different for assisted living versus skilled nursing, depending on how the GPO is contracted with that specific PBM. Some of them are going to the route of it's just one rate, um, which is higher, right? But keep in mind, too, we're talking about strengths. You know, weaknesses are that your operating costs are tremendously higher. You've got to deliver all of these medications. So you've got to have a delivery team, vehicles. You got car accidents or you can courier it out and then that's, a, you know, a way of minim mitigating that. But then you've still had a higher expensive delivery. So, yes, you're making more money, but you're also having more staff, higher expenses. Um, you're you're going to need automation, most likely, if you're doing any volume. And, um, yeah, so there are, you know, some weaknesses and reasons why you may not want to do it. Um, 
you know. So is it capital intensive? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it is capital intensive and your, your drug costs are, you know, you do have um, a fair amount of drug costs, which you do in any business, right? But so on the other side, you, uh, another strength is you generally can purchase better under some of these GPO contracts. Um, so there is a benefit there versus, I, I think the nice thing about being in the long-term care space and being under a GPO is, and this used to be how it was in retail, is like you have an umbrella that's advocating for you and they really do have leverage. Um, and and the every year or two years, depending on how long the contract is with the PBM, they're they're negotiating hard, you know, to keep reimbursements where they are, and you know, and get improvements if you can. They've, there's also something called GERs now, which is generic effective rate. So instead of um, instead of P PBMs were playing games where they were just uh, they weren't they were just saying here's the reimbursement on these generics so they came up with a generic effective rate and said okay well, you know it has to be awp minus you know 70 or whatever that number is right and across all the members of the gpo it has to equal that and if it doesn't they have to write it the pbm has to write a check to the to the gpo and it's just you know dispersed proportionately so there's just more protections in place um to you know so that you can actually make a you know a decent living you know, or, or you can be more successful or monetarily. I, I guess it's all relatively or decent. Like, I, I remember working in long-term care facilities before. People have made killings in that space. Um, but one of the things I'm thinking about is the fact that the specific pharmacy system I was thinking about that did it was basically four pharmacists who got together, combined their four ph pharmacies, and, and made a huge deal. They, they land up selling to, I believe, CVS at one point, to Caremark really, uh, at one point. But anyway, they don't remember. Um, the, the point being, it felt like long-term care was never a one-man shop that grows sort of consistently over time. It was always, you start big and you grow bigger. Is that fair or is that an unfair characterization? I think that's unfair. I think there's a lot of people that start. I think you need to know what you're doing, right? I think that... Okay. Um, my buddy that's starting his pharmacies took a lot of the things he learned working with me and and now has applied that. And he had a lot of relationships, too. So he was able to leverage all of those relationships and able to grow business quickly versus saying, I'm stepping into this space. I don't know anybody. And he's even dialing it in even more, which he's very, very specific about behavioral health. You know, we were doing hospice, assisted living and behavioral health. And he is niching behavioral health explicitly, which I think is a great idea. I, I suggested that he stay in that space and not and not go um, like, you know, not be so diverse. Okay, so, so far, we, we now have the risks of higher operating costs, um, de uh, delivery teams that you have to worry about, vehicles, you now start worrying about car accidents. Uh, you're, you're talking about, once you have volume, you're talking about automation, higher drug costs, uh, but on the other hand, you did add one more, which was the GER, the generic uh, effective rate, which which does hopefully offset a little bit of this. Um, so so we've spoken in general about str uh, strengths and weaknesses, and you've hinted a little bit at opportunities. Um, you've spoken a little bit about uh, skilled nursing facilities, um, assisted living facilities, behavioral health, et cetera. Are there any that stick out to you as being particularly prime for um, either disruption or entry? And if so, why? Well, I think behavioral health was. And then I think a lot when I stepped into behavioral health, all the big players were sort of not interested in it. They're like, we'd rather go to a skilled nursing facility with 200 beds and deliver there. And that's it and not have to do you know, a delivery to a residential community home where there's five beds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that they recognize it's an opportunity, but I think they're very challenged to try to go into that space because it's a very high maintenance space versus a low maintenance space. So they were, when I stepped into the space, they were very underserved. We came up with a model to really provide a high level of service 
to that community. And that's why we're able to, to grow in that space. So I still think that's a great space. I mean, I, I think things ebb and flow. I think nursing homes are struggling now. So pharmacies in that space may be taking a haircut, but then they, maybe they need to be looking at, you know, SCOs like Senior Whole Health, which are programs to keep people residing in the community, but they pay for the compliance packaging on top of the dispensing fees and the reimbursements. So that can be very lucrative. And um, I think there are just newer things out there and it's always sort of landscapes always changing as um, as the as their healthcare model really keeps changing. You know, it, it, they're trying to you know, ACOs and they're really trying to figure out like what's the best cost effective way to to provide health care and hold the providers accountable for outcomes. And in doing so, I think there's going to be newer and newer opportunities. So we've spoken about the types of areas you can get into. Do you think from an opportunity standpoint, there are opportunities in the, and what, what, what I think we've spoken about is areas that are open for entry. Are there areas that are open for disruption that you're going, these are areas we really should be concentrating on. I'll sort of throw out an example. Telemedicine opens up new avenues to consider in this space now because it simply didn't exist when you were, when you had your own pharmacy, but now if you're going to go into it, I'd probably consider more telemedicine because it opens up all these new opportunities. What space within um, within long-term care would you say is, is ripe to be disrupted? Well, I mean, I, th I, I, I think that pharmacy in general is ripe to be disrupted, right? I think that everybody's trying to do it, right? Like you, you had Jamie Dimon and Buffett, and I'm not sure who else he teamed up with, and they were trying to put something together there. Bezos. I think it was Bezos. Bezos. Was it? Yeah. And then, and now you've got Mark Cuban trying to disrupt it by saying, look, you know, we're going to, whatever we buy the product for, we're going to give it to you, plus you pay shipping and, you know, we make right. a, do a dollar or something. And and, and that may be very disruptive um, if, if that sort of catches on. Um, but you also have a lot of big players out there that are, you know, not going to be happy about those things, right? And CVS is also the, you know, the biggest PBM. So, um, right, you know, there's some monopoly play and there's some, some trade craft there. Um, I think that until pharmacists have provider status and can get reimbursement for our skill sets, um, you're not going to see a lot of disruption because everything is still going to be tied to a product. We only make money by dispensing a product. So it really limits innovation, right? You, because we, 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 you know, there's only so many different ways that you can dispense a product and ha have it be interesting and make money doing it. Right. And it all ties back to, to either somebody's paying cash or somebody's getting a reimbursement, right? You know, GoodRx was a was a great model, um, and did very and has done very very well. And um, you know, they just had to get one person to bite, right? Like to 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 do that model. And somebody finally somebody said, "Oh yeah, you know, this is good. I'll drive business in the door." Um, but I think that they're paying like seven dollars to just you know to good erection every script or something like that, and that is that's insane. You know, like I would not let that in my farm. Like I would not take good RX, You know, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, because it, it, and and you can set your price, but if you, if you want to be competitive, you're going to have to be dirt cheap, and you're still and then you're not making any money. You know, um, <clears throat> Shaw's seems to have really good prices with good RX. But um, but they can't be making money. They must be getting volume, right? And then they're hoping that somebody that comes in to get their prescription is going to buy bread, you know, or something, right? And it, it translates into into sales. Um, but none of that translates in the long term care space. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we're not taking people. I mean, I would never, you know. Hey, listen, you know, I'd like my prescriptions for my assisted living mom filled under good rx i'd be like you know what we're not doing that so you can pay cash how about that <laughs> and, and do you think telemedicine is going to have any disruptive effects or especially in the long-term care space or not so much i don't think it really affects pharmacy 
I, I mean, it, it, tell me if you see it differently, but I don't see how it affects pharmacy per se. And telemedicine really is, for the most part, I think, a place for psych. It, if if you're if you're not feeling well, it's hard to do a lot of diagnostics. If you if you're you know if you well, have knee pain, it's kind of hard to do diagnostics via telemedicine. <clears throat> well, two parts to it. So number one, I, I think that telemedicine is already having a pretty big impact in in regular pharmacy, and sp especially specialty pharmacy. For example, there are the, um, I think there's HIMS, there's HERS, there's RO. All these are essentially systems that'll go, we'll deliver the drug to you, hell, we'll have a uh, physician available to diagnose and, and prescribe if necessary. Um, but that conversation only enables the connection. Essentially, you land up setting up a clinic and the pharmacy becomes a billing me uh, mechanism for that clinic. Um, but, but do you foresee more and more pharmacies going, you know what, if I want to work with more patients, I'm, go I'm going to, uh, say, say in a skilled nursing facility, I'm going to have my own doctor available who can either review the charts, uh, prescribe, or just be available to address questions because this paging doctors getting orders changed is just way too disruptive. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think for lifestyle meds, it it makes absolute sense. It's really just convenience, right? Like I need a refill on my birth control. I'm going to hop on the call. You know, they're going to ask me three, three questions or, you know, if you need Cialis or whatever it is. But for lifestyle meds, but there's only so many companies that can do that, right? Like there's only so many Casper mattresses that like can create that model and be successful. And then it's like, well, you're just another company. What are you going to do? Do it cheaper? It, like the model's there. Um, yeah. And then it's coming out of a central pharmacy and they just get licensed every day and they're shipping it to you. And they're not doing controlled substances. They're not doing anything. Um, I mean, maybe it, it gets expanded further, right? Maybe um, you're on a tour and and you have a telemedicine visit with your prescriber or prior to you having a telemedicine prescription visit with your prescriber your you have to go to quest get labs done and those labs are sent to your doctor so then you have a telemedicine and it's just really reviewing your labs um and making modifications on 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 medication right but i mean i honestly think that that's where pharmacists should be in, in, inserted right like i think that's a space that we should like i mean that's what pas are doing Right. I mean, they're they're functioning in that capacity. NPs can from in Massachusetts can, can function on their own. They don't even need, uh, you know, MD. Um, but why wouldn't a pharmacist be able to look at labs and make a modification? I mean, they do in the VA system. Right. right. Um, so I think that's the space that pharmacists should be in where, yeah, they're not doing the maybe the initial um prescribing of something but they're making modifications like all right look you know your a1c is a little high we're going to adjust your metformin up and the note goes to the prescriber and then the prescriber is like yep i'm fine with that etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean i think that's where we should be now everybody's fighting including you know nurses are practitioners but you know pharmacists aren't practitioners I mean, uh, under C under cms guidance right i guess the, the question becomes and we can get into this as a separate discussion anyways but the question becomes, were we trained to do this as, as pharmacists? And there's a whole bunch of disruption as to how much training people have had and who's focusing more on, say, industrial pharmacy versus compounding versus clinical versus something else. So anyway, so, so that was the um, opportunities. What are the weaknesses of getting into this? We, we discussed um, weaknesses, sorry, threats. What are the threats in for this space as we continue? Well, dramatic changes in reimbursement structure, CMS changes the way that they med D plans are structured. Um, if they if they don't, if CMS somehow changes uh, their critical mass guidelines to be a med D plan, then GPOs have zero leverage, like the, in a retail environment, which would which would just catastrophically destroy uh, long term care pharmacy. Um, it would just be going the way of retail. It would just you know, DIR reimbursements at, at losses, um, and people would just be closing up shop. 
Um, I think that's the biggest threat. I mean, other threats are, you know, what's going on across the board, you know, workforce issues, um, high, you know, increasing costs of the workforce. So people requiring more and more compensation to do the job. Um, in my space, we relied highly, heavily on technicians and technicians are, are not something that people, you know, if you go to school to be a phlebotomist, you're going to go draw blood and you're going to go make money. Right. But people don't generally go to school to be a pharmacy technician. So the minute that there's a better opportunity, uh, unless they're extremely dedicated and they love what they do, the minute there's a better opportunity to do something in another profession, um, you know, they, they may go there. So it's very, very difficult to train and re and, and retain people in that space. And, um, you know, I, I would say that that's a big threat as well. And it's been an ongoing threat. Um, but yeah, even, you know, I had 45 delivery vehicles and 95, 100 drivers. And um, in today's day and age, you're paying somebody 20, 25 bucks an hour. Uh, it would just be near impossible to be to, to manage something like that. And and also try to keep people employed, right? Where they're, they want to do it, you know, they want to take deliveries. Um, that those are the big hurdles that I see. Um, and, and then the changing dem demographics. So, um, <clears throat> if you are a pharmacy that is not nimble and you are focused on skilled nursing and reimbursements change on the state plans and, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. And nursing homes start going out of business, then, then you are going to be going out of business and, you know, and, and servicing nursing homes is very different than servicing assisted living, right? You don't need carts. You need pharmacists to be rounding with doctors. You need, um, you know, chart review. There's a lot more intensity, but then there's also more latitude where, uh, you can call the nursing home, get a nurse on the phone and say, listen, so-and-so is out of a you know refill. They can get you that. But then, so there's always pros and cons to every patient population that you're working with. Um, so I think those are some of the threats. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of more, but a uh, high level. Absolutely. Um, before we go, Rudy, how can people reach you? Uh, you can go to wearerudy.com and uh, you can reach me through there. These conversations are not intended to be legal, regulatory, or clinical advice and may not be right for you. These conversations are intended for educational purposes only. Conversations on this forum do not create an attorney-client 